If the Sun is the largest mass taking up space in the universe, what would count as some of the smallest? While there are a lot of varying objects making up that last 0.14% of the solar system's mass, none might be more intriguing than the earthly phenomenon of meteor showers, better known as shooting stars. Some meteor showers we witness on Earth are from debris shed from famous comets, such as the Perseids shower that happens every August. The first records of humans witnessing and documenting these shooting stars happened all the way back in 36 AD, written in detail in ancient Chinese historical journals. Of all the comets in space, the most famous is probably Halley's Comet, the only short-period comet visible to humans on a consistent basis. It can be viewed from Earth every 75 years or so, and is next due to arrive in the night sky in 2061. To see old remnants of Halley's Comet requires a much shorter wait. In fact, every year in late October, one can view the Orionid meteor shower. These annual showers are made up of the debris and other particles shed from previous passages of Halley's Comet. A lot of people around the world claim to have never witnessed a shooting star screaming across the sky. It makes sense too, when considering how quickly meteor showers go by from beginning to end. It requires a bit of luck for the casual viewer to witness the phenomenon. However, there are ways to ensure a greater chance at spotting a shooting star, and it usually revolves around the time of day. Truthfully, many folks haven't spotted a meteor shower because they aren't awake at the time they are most prolific. For the best shot at spotting a shooting star, make sure to set your alarm for the early morning hours prior to dawn. It wouldn't help if you plan to do so on the night of a new moon, as the lack of moonlight will help open up the night canvas to dimmer meteor showers. Cousins of comets are their Earth-drawn counterparts, called meteorites. Meteorites are fragments of asteroids ranging in sizes from little rocks to massive boulders. Instead of passing by Earth, however, they enter Earth's atmosphere and usually vaporize soon afterwards. Sometimes these actions leave behind small trails of burnt meteorites, creating meteor showers just like the comet-born shooting stars. It's a common misconception that meteorites are just as rare as the aforementioned shooting stars. However, in reality, Earth is met with millions of meteorites every single day, amassing thousands and thousands of tons of rock burning up through the atmosphere. That being said, most of these daily meteorites are of the small variety that never come anywhere close to landing on Earth. Of course, there have been incredibly rare instances on Earth of much larger meteorites making it through the initial burn of Earth's atmosphere and crashing into the planet's surface. It should be noted that these types of meteorites differ from asteroids, much larger space objects that have led to widespread destruction when falling to Earth, such as the asteroid 66 million years ago that led to mass extinction and a 10-year sulfuric ice age. Rather, the largest meteorite of much smaller proportions fell to Earth much more recently, estimated at 80,000 years ago. This meteorite is called the Hoba meteorite, and is located in Namibia, Africa. It was discovered in 1920 and weighs around 65 tons. The meteorite has long fascinated scientists, as it left no impact crater or debris pile. It's also of a peculiar shape for a meteorite, being flat on each major side of the former space rock. With all of the rock fragments and minuscule meteorites that hit the Earth, surely they must come from somewhere. It can be hard to reconcile when you go most of your life learning about the solar system in terms of the planets and the sun, but there really is so much more out there. In fact, our solar system itself features a whopping 194 moons, 
3.5 thousand comets, and just under 800,000 asteroids, both in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, and beyond. The asteroid belt is probably one of the collective objects you've heard of or studied outside of planets and stars, but did you know there are a few other major objects of reference? The first is another type of belt, called the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt exists in the outer region of the solar system, beyond the likes of Pluto. It hosts other dwarf planets too, such as Haumea and Makemake. The Kuiper Belt is also the birthplace of many comets that exist in the solar system. Most notably in the Kuiper Belt are objects made of ice, some as large as 100 kilometers in diameter. Most short-period comets are thought to come from this region in space, due to the frigid temperatures and distance from the Sun, making ice formation much easier. Staying within our local solar system and just beyond the Kuiper Belt is the Oort Cloud, another icy realm filled with over two trillion objects, including a few dwarf planets. The Oort Cloud is where a majority of long-period comets are thought to originate, born from icy objects that have been around since the birth of the universe. These materials are thought to be impacted by other stars and various objects outside of the solar system, as the distance from the Sun makes them subject to the effects of other Milky Way stars. The Oort Cloud acts as a shell and surrounds the solar system in all directions, forming a spherical-like object if viewing from afar. A big question that arises from the matter of the Oort Cloud asks where these stars and other objects influencing our solar system come from. Since the early days of the Milky Way galaxy's existence, it has slowly merged with other smaller galaxies over time. This includes the Sagittarius Dwarf Spheroidal, and is just 70,000 light-years from Earth. The stars and other matter from these miniature galaxies and various systems have then started whipping around the Milky Way at astonishingly high speeds, up to 220 km per second. It's easy to presume that with these merges and chaotic nature of movement within the galaxy, certain actions would have direct impact on the Oort Cloud, which then has a direct impact on the solar system too. It might be hard to imagine that between the trillions of objects in the Milky Way alone, including millions upon millions of stars, planets and tiny galaxies, everything orbits the centre of the galaxy at a uniform speed. It would make sense for certain objects to move slower or faster depending on its own mass, gravitational effects and proximity to the heart of the Milky Way. Thus scientists can only explain the uniformed speeds as the byproduct of a dark matter shell engulfing the Milky Way. Dark matter is still unobserved, but because it makes up a large portion of all matter in the universe, it is the most sensible explanation. If you were surprised to hear about the existence of an unknown type of matter, it's not the only property that astronomers believe exists out in the dark sides of the universe. Along with dark matter is a theoretical type of energy called dark energy. The idea of dark energy comes from the basic understanding that our universe is currently expanding at an accelerating rate. Unfortunately, what could be causing this acceleration defies our understanding of gravity and energy outputs in general, which forces scientists to label the cause with an unknown source. Dark energy was calculated to have a density that is much lower than other matter in space, but makes up most of the density of the observable universe due to its consistency in all corners. Even if you have heard of the theoretical dark matter and dark energy, 
There is an additional hypothesis that believes dark matter and dark energy are actually one in the same, collectively referred to as dark fluid. The theory of dark fluid states that both dark energy and dark matter come from the same origin point and exist as a single physical property. It also states that when looking at the universe on a massive scale, dark matter is activated in relation to galaxies, and dark energy is activated in relation to clusters and the observable universe as a whole. With the presence of dark matter and dark energy, it's easier for astronomers to explain why the universe is expanding at an accelerated pace, but not how fast the universe is expanding in this very moment. In March of 2021, the University of California Berkeley published findings that stated the universe is currently expanding at a rate of 73.3 km per second per megaparsec which is one unit of 3.3 million light years. These findings are drawn from changes in the cosmic microwave background and the changes in density of non-dark matter from the early years of our universe, some 12 to 13 billion years ago. It's easy to hear this information and think that the universe will simply continue expanding faster and faster for all eternity. The universe is already at such an incomprehensible size, getting bigger isn't really hard to fathom. However, there is no guarantee that the universe will simply grow to infinity. Rather, it's been calculated that the universe is actually already beginning to slow its accelerated expansion, albeit on a macro scale. These calculations lead scientists to predict that within the next 65 million years or so, the expansion of the universe will decelerate, and then completely stop expanding altogether 35 million years after that. Once the universe stops expanding, research suggests dark energy might reverse its function and become attractive, reverting expansion and beginning to contract in on itself. If the universe really was to stop expanding and reverse into a state of contraction, what would that mean for the rest of us out here drifting through the cosmos? Very simple equations would suggest that with a reversal in the universe's growth, the contraction would force time to move backwards. Events would happen out of sequence, life would be lived old to young, and you would die before you were ever born. Of course, models that dig deeper into the proper equations reveal a much more complex scenario. In reality, time would continue to move forward, and we'd carry on with our lives like always. The biggest change a contraction would bring is a blue shift in the universe, in which the light that travels from one source to another would take less time and the frequency would heighten. This causes light to appear more blue than red and we'd be able to study light in a whole new way. It would also allow for scientists to calculate the rate of contraction, which would give us a rough estimation on how long the universe has left until it contracts in on itself and ends just as violently as it began during the Big Bang. This end of the world scenario is referred to as the Big Crunch, and is one of the few ways experts agree the universe and our existence could end one day far, far into the future. Thank you for watching this episode of Access Astronomy. We look forward to seeing you next week for another video.